Thank you, Ben, and thank you, band, and singers. Um, let's turn to Luke chapter 12, if we can, in our Bibles. And I want to uh, talk about today searching for love. So, um, just looking at a little story here in verse 13. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take him. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do, I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, Soul, you paying attention, Thou hast much goods laid up for many years, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this, soul, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. Now, um, this is very much the Western way, and probably one of our biggest challenges in finding um, love and in the forms, the different forms that people try to find it, I guess, and I might go there in a moment, is that we, uh, we have it so good, we have things that we can uh, enjoy of this life, that we sometimes allow it to be uh, our first love more than anything else. And um, it's, um, you know, when you're growing up, when you're just going right back to being a child, I suppose that maybe one of the things that any child wants is quite simple, is to have a happy family. That's a pretty simple thing that maybe not a lot actually get these days because of the disruptive homes that have come about in our lifestyle. And um, so, but as we, as we grow up and we start to find out what money can do, um, we might uh, get ourselves, and I remember getting my first car, which was, uh, I think my first two cars were actually hand-me-downs, uh, one from my parents and one from my brother, um, not Tom, um, my other brother. And um, the, uh, the first one, I th as I recall, was a 1956 Morris Oxford, for those who might know what such a creature is. And... Um, that was, uh, it did actually roll along the road, you know, when you turned the engine on. It, um, in fact, I could remember picking Kathy up in it for work. Um, and uh, I remember a particular corner we used to try to get around and I would sort of be sitting in the seat, bouncing on the seat, trying to get the car to go a little faster because I thought it might help. Um, the, uh, the one after that was an FC Holden, um, for those who, again, go back that sort of distance. Uh, my pride and joy that I could um, get the manual out and I could get underneath the car and I could work on it and fix the clutch or whatever went wrong because back in those days uh, um, I did used to trust my own ability to see what I could do to the car and I think I didn't have the money to take it to a mechanic like Brent, Brent, Brenton that was just up here. Um, and um, so... Um, you did sort of pour a bit of money into that. It was not, even though you didn't go to a mechanic, it cost you a bit to keep it rolling. And uh, for a young fella, it is, um, you know, a bit of a pride and joy, and then you try to see how you can tweak it to see how fast you can go. And uh, if you can sort of get that dial, we used to have a, a uh, well, we still have a dial on our car uh, that would sort of uh, uh, zoom along the road and hopefully you wouldn't do yourself or anybody else any damage. Um, 
And it sort of progresses along that path uh, with all the nice things that we have in, in life and that, that are available or that used to be. You know, there's the dr there was the dream of owning your own uh, house of a reasonable size and uh, to be able to uh, get yourself a, a mortgage, the hand of death, as it translates from Latin, and it keeps you tied up for the rest of your days. And um, so you go and you work hard to try and pay off the bill uh, that comes along with it. And so it goes on in life that we get very caught up with uh, the things that money can buy and, and the experiences that we can have, the places that we can go for holidays. And uh, in uh, this day and age, uh, many of us have even been able to afford to get onto uh, aeroplanes and uh, maybe that's slowed down a bit with COVID and since with the price of things going up. But I, I often quote that uh, the first time we took a plane ride as a family was back in, um, I think, 1993 or thereabouts. Uh, we went for uh, we ha our prophecy display that we had here, we took across to Perth. And a return flight for Perth back in those days used to be something around eight or $900. And uh, all of a sudden, because of some competition, uh, it was brought down to 350 return. And so we, um, it was cheaper for us as a family to fly across than for us to drive, have hotel accommodation, me take three days off work each way, and, uh, and so on. It all added up. It was cheaper for us to fly. So we flew. And uh, that was a unique experience for us. Um, but of course, as the years have gone on, uh, I've been quite amazed that that flight across to Perth you can still pick it up for the same price as we got it in 1993. So it has made it more available as the years have gone on for people to be able to do such things and um, if they have good reason to do it. That's our Western world. Um, and so we enjoy all of these things and, uh, and they can become pursuits of happiness. They can become our, our loves. And... Um, and as we see here in this story, that there's a guy sort of so caught up with what money does that he's fighting over the inheritance and he wouldn't be the first and last to have done that. And to think, well, what can I do with that money that comes from that inheritance? And Jesus uh, sort of makes a really important point to him and he says, look out for covetousness because really covetousness is a love of things that... Um, maybe will drive you in a wrong direction. A love of possessions and experiences and nice this and nice that that we can have. And, um, and so in another place in the scriptures, it says that covetousness is idolatry. So it's a, it's a love that sort of takes us um, beyond a love of God. It's sort of, or instead of a love of God. And, of course, we know what it's like in our world. that We've always got advertisements coming our way. Get this, save this much money. Uh, you know, you get 50% off. They're not mentioning how much you actually have to spend, but it's how much you're going to get off. And, uh, you know, some people, I think, uh, know that when their husband or wife comes home and says, I'm going to save this much money, that they're not actually telling you how much they're going to have to spend and because uh, it's such a good bargain. And um, the scriptures tell us that the love of money is the root of all evil. And so there's a, there's a love there that can very definitely in, in our country get a hold of us and it can, um, it can take us in a wrong direction. And, and the Lord here was trying to say to this man in this story that something's got hold of you and it's made you miss the bigger picture of what needs to be pursued in life. And if we read on in verse 22, and he said to his disciples, therefore I say unto you, take no thought or anxious thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for the body, what you shall put on. Sort of don't get all worried about your clothing and, and so on and so on. The life is more than meat and the body is more than raiment. And he goes through this passage uh, just explaining to them about how the, the lilies of the field and the, the birds of the air don't have to worry and they, they're all beautiful and provided for. Um, and in verse um, uh, 28, if then 
God so clothed the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven. How much more uh, will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither sh uh, be you of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world uh, seek after. And your Father knoweth that you have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. And he starts to introduce here um, this thought of something better to fulfil us. And um, I suppose that um, the pursuit of, of love really starts with getting it right with God first. And, um, you know, many people have left God out of the picture. And so when they're trying to describe what love is, they haven't yet met the author of love. And so they, in fact, sometimes they take his book and they change it to suit themselves, never mind the plagiarism. You know, there are people who've got a six-coloured rainbow. Now, that rainbow comes out of a particular book and it's to do with a particular God and his teachings and all the good things that are associated with that promise of that rainbow. And, and they, they feel that if they take something from the book, a part of it, that they'll be able to get the benefits. But they sort of, they pull it apart and they, they actually lose the benefits. So maybe that one colour of the rainbow that they're leaving out is that I don't want God in this. I'll have the rest of it, but I don't want God. I don't want any supervisor over me. And so they seek love in all sorts of ways that God never intended and uh, leaving God out and not loving each other the way that God had intended. Others, maybe with very good intention, write books like um, uh, The Five Love Languages to try to, maybe it's understanding ourselves or men and women understanding each other and how they love each other and, um, and all in good intention and maybe they've got some good points to make. Um, but I, I, I want to perhaps... Uh, just consider here today this thought that this um, man that Jesus is speaking to, he says, what happens if your soul is required tonight? Then of all the things that you have gathered and all the things that you have loved together, what good will they do you then after that moment? Now, we have just uh, experienced here in our assembly uh, a number of people passing away in the Lord and um, one of them as Pastor Chris was just mentioning turning up um, for volunteer work at the op shop and uh, before she checked in she checked out and um, but she was ready with the Lord and the treasures that she has laid up uh, are all safe and, and, and the same applies to the others that we're, we're considering here at the moment. You know, Job, he, he says that he's brought nothing into this world and he'll take nothing out. And so matter, no matter how many experiences we might build up, no matter how much of a bucket list we might think that we have enjoyed in the last part of our life, um, none of that is going to be of any value the moment that we die. Our, our list of, of, of activities, our list of achievements uh, in this life, none of it is going to count for anything after we die. And, and uh, I'm sure that's the point that the Lord is trying to make to this guy here, to say, you've sort of, you're barking up the wrong tree. You're chasing the wrong goals. If you want to make your life really fulfilled, if you really want to do what life is about if you really want to know what's going to come after this life you're headed completely in the wrong direction let's go to John chapter 3 I wonder if we can also just get that first hymn up um, 189 I think it was there was a, a verse there that I wanted to pay attention to John chapter 3 and in verse um, 14 and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, this is Jesus speaking, 
Even so must the Son of Man, which is one of Jesus' descriptions of himself, because he was the Son of God, but he was also the Son of Man. So the Holy Ghost came upon Mary. Mary was a natural person. So he sort of got this uh, godly part and this human part. So he calls himself here the Son of Man, be lifted up. Now what he's talking about being lifted up here is that he's going to be lifted up on the cross. So he says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have uh, eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Now it's interesting what it says here in verse 17 that a lot of people feel the moment you start talking about God or about Jesus or about Christianity that it's about judgment. But this verse says here that God didn't send his son for judgment. He came to save the world. So he actually came with love more than anybody, any love that people had ever seen. And I want to talk here really today about such love. Such love as the world had never, ever seen before. And so he says here uh, that in verse 14 about him being lifted up, and there's another scripture where he says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. It would be such a love that it would draw people to him. And of course, through history over those last 2,000 years, and particularly as we've seen even in the last century, that people are just being drawn in truckloads to Jesus Christ. Now, it's not always the feeling you have when you talk to your next door neighbour here at the moment because uh, um, people are trying to take God out of the picture. But praise the Lord for all of us here that have been drawn to this love. And we had looked here, there and everywhere to find it. But all of a sudden we were confronted and, and shown what it was that Jesus had done for us and uh, we saw it in his people. We came along to a, a meeting here. We saw the change, the power of God in somebody's life. And somewhere it got us here. Not just here, but it got us here. And, and, and we thought, yep, I want to commit to that. I want to I give back to that. Because somehow or other we have all of a sudden had our eyes opened to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to forgive us of everything that we ever did wrong. Everything that we ever did. And we said, I'll take that, thank you. And we got filled with a love that was enough to last us through every trial that we will ever face. Through every year that we will live, we were given such a fire at the beginning that if we maintained that, we would never have to go looking for another love anywhere else in that sense, that we would be so filled with such love, above and beyond all other love. And the, uh, the amazing thing about it is that, yes, we all like to find somebody to love um, and be married and live happily ever after and praise the Lord for the stories that happen like that. But there are those who haven't had that and yet are fulfilled or those who have been married and have a, had a happy marriage and, and perhaps their, their spouse has died and yet that love still remains that they have with God or they have somebody that they're married to that doesn't follow the Lord and yet their love that they have that has come from God still remains and never lacks. And it is something far above what the world ever gives and of any natural love that we might be able to find. And Jesus was trying to show this to us. Let's go to chapter 13. In verse 34... A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one to another. So 
he's trying to again he's reminding us here that this is actually going to be possible that the way that he has loved us by giving his life is going to be a way that we are going to be able to love one another and something which has always been a bit of a struggle in society and and he said it will actually be an advertisement of the church now unfortunately in a lot of religion we know that there is self-righteousness and there is hypocrisy and and this doesn't necessarily apply when people get away from the infilling of the Holy Ghost and they, they push the Holy Spirit to one side no no we can we can do our own religion without the Holy Spirit and so they don't, they don't get to find out what this is really like they get all caught up in religious processes that they've been taught Kathy and I have just come back from uh, South Africa from Cape Town and uh, it was um, yeah uh, I suppose a sad occasion for uh, um, some families there where they've lost a young girl and uh, a daughter and um, and there is a lot of um, sadness of course in that but there is also a sustaining in them by the Lord they know the bigger picture they know that their daughter has made it and the support that you see between each other um, amongst the saints and the, the vision that they have for the future that one day they'll all be together again uh, is very strong and it's, uh, it's terrific to see um, we were um, staying in a place a bed and breakfast where there was a lady there who is caught up in the religious approach and uh, we thought we were so, sort of when we maybe we're still hoping we might be able to get through to her a bit because she was brought up with the religious approach of love which is uh, you know you you go along to the um, the catholic church and um, you know you you obey all their rules and if you don't obey them then you've got to go away and say 10 Hail Marys and and um, and she was trying to reason her way through this and she said in her South African accent which I won't try and do she said when I say 10 Hail Marys she says is God an imbecile that he doesn't understand me and hear me the first time how come I have to do it 10 times and have to do it 10 times the next day and the next day she says surely when I call out to God the first time he'll hear me and so it was good to be able to talk a bit more to her about the Lord they don't know the love of God they don't know God and, and so they haven't experienced a, a God who, who answers and does something for them but we do all the people said and we have found out that he does care for us and he does watch over us and so really what he said, Jesus is saying here is that he wants us to love as he has loved in other words to love the father first and that will enable us to love each other because when we love him first he puts his love within us by the Holy Ghost and, and then we will be able to overcome all things and this is our whole purpose this is our whole purpose we can search for love in all sorts of places but if we understand this we will be totally fulfilled come what may with possessions whether we have possessions or not whether we have experiences or not we may have very little and, and one of the things that I think many of us have been able to hear about in our fellowship and, and I guess Cathy and I and some others have been uh, um, able to view in other countries, other of our assemblies is that revival seems to happen in the poorest of places the most where people have the least possessions the biggest part of our revival all around the world is in those sort of circumstances so it's not about what we have in this life but how much we we come to know and to appreciate what God has done for us um, just uh, we had some good news the other day I think I might have mentioned before that we we met a lady in a um, little town called Caniva on the way to Geelong and um, uh, Kathy got talking to her about the Lord she was running a motel there she still is and um, 
uh, others passed through there and Brother Greg went and prayed with her to receive the Holy Spirit and, uh, and she did. And, um, but she found it very difficult to get baptised, to be able to get to a meeting somewhere to get baptised. And eventually uh, the, the people down in Mount Gambia uh, took the baptism tank to her or I think that's how it worked. Anyway, they baptised her in Caniva. Might have even been in a bath there. And um, so uh, <clears throat> if... If you can't come to us, we'll come to you. And anyway, uh, after she'd been baptised, apparently she, uh, she came out as, as relieved as all out because she knew how important it was for her to be baptised. Some people make it light of it, but she knew she needed to bury her old life as well as get a new one through the Holy Ghost. And um, anyway, uh, so she came out and she saw some of her workers there and she said you won't be able to trouble me at all today she says I've just been baptised I'm, I'm as happy as all out so uh, good on her um, it's a wonderful experience let's go to Second Peter chapter 1 In verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the, the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. That says a fair bit in itself. Grace and peace be multiplied through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, the, out, out in, again, the religious world, there are those who try to teach you that when you come to know Jesus Christ, he's going to pay all your bills. He's going to bless you financially. Invest here. Invest there. You know, you're going to go up in, in the stakes in the world. But that's not what this is telling us here. It's telling us quite the opposite. It says the precious things that are going to be given to us are the divine nature. You know, that we would find ourselves changed within and to be able to value the things that God values and so that when Jesus would walk around and he would see the leper and he would see the rich man and he would see the centurion or the woman with the issue of blood and his, he would understand them and he would have an answer for them he wasn't, you know, Jesus could have come here and, and built an empire but his nature was to see the need of the individual. And that divine nature, it says, has been put in us. That's the, this great thing that we have become partakers of. And whether we are partakers of other things in life, well, so be it. You might have been born wealthy. I'm not sure if there's too many people here in that category. Or maybe work might have gone well for you. But maybe it hasn't. But that's no measure of your walk in the Lord. Or maybe you haven't found the person that you want to marry yet. <laughs> or, or maybe you're not going to marry again. That doesn't mean that you're missing out on the blessing of God or the love of God. And if we measure it all by those standards, they are just the standards of this world. They might be nice things that we can have, but they're not God's measure of love. And so it tells us here, we just read it again, whereby given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, we're going to live forever, not married. There'll be no marriage in the kingdom of God. There'll be none of the possessions. You won't be taking your house with you. Some might be happy. There's too many repairs to do. You won't be taking your car with you. Same thing. So... It says that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. There are a lot of things we can lust after in this world that will not make us happy. And, and you know it in yourself when it sort of gets a bit of a hold of you. 
You know, it'd be nice to get that kitchen done up, but if it's really possessed you <laughs> and has made you unhappy, has got you stressed, then somewhere it's sort of the value of things has gone wrong. You know, the, the, the Lord says to the rich man, before you go plan to do business in this city or that city, if the Lord will, if the Lord will, this will happen. If it won't, it won't. And let us uh, not strive over these things which we uh, don't have to have as part of our existence in this world. Luke 21. It's nice when it comes our way and it's enjoyable, but it's not the be-all and end-all. Luke 21 and verse 1. And Jesus looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, Of a truth, I say unto you that this poor widow has cast in more than they all. For all these of their abundance uh, have cast into the offerings of God, but she of her penury or her poverty has cast in all the living that she had because she loved God, because she appreciated the love of God, that all she wanted to do was in some way serve the Lord. And, um, and if and when we're going to die, and I say if, because we may not die if the Lord comes back first, but if and when we're going to die, do we want to die serving the Lord? Do we want to die committed to him in whatever we do? Or do we, do we want to be like the man who was just building up more and more for himself, uh, the things that he can't take with him? And, you know, it's, it's such a fulfilling thing for anybody who has been in that position that not only having come to the Lord yourself but being able to share the gospel with somebody else and praying with them and seeing God answer a prayer for them. Whether that's them getting filled with the Holy Spirit or some other answer to their prayer and you think we're laying up treasure in heaven together here. We're, we're banking together. Let's go to the bank together in our prayers for each other and our support of each other uh, to, to lay up things which are going to last forever and can't be taken away from us. And, you know, the... Um, it, yeah, I was just uh, going to make a bit of a comparison with our experience in South Africa just now. Um, the um, South Africa is a very interesting country. It's a, a country of real contrasts. Um, the outstanding thing that you you notice when you first come in, when you fly in, is Table Mountain, which is a a, a beautiful a part of a, a range of mountains and uh, it has a cable car that can take you up to the top and you can walk across the top and look down over the city. But one of the other things you notice as you're flying in is this huge settlement area of squatters that are uh, people who are coming from all of Africa down to South Africa because South Africa is sort of well, has been well developed financially, although that's changing, and, um, and they are looking for work. And so they're living in what we would probably call garden sheds. Um, but they've just put them together, one after another after another, and you just see them. They go for, for, for kilometres. Um, and, um, and then to survive in those, the government has actually come in and, and you'll see poles that stand up between them, lots of poles with electricity cables coming down from them. Um, so any of our electricians here that might worry about that, you've probably got good cause to worry about it. Um, and, but what it does is it gives everybody a little bit of power to their shed uh, and they'll have a satellite dish and uh, they'll be able to run a phone and a fridge uh, and, and just do basic living as a family in this. And so in those areas are probably many good people that have come down from other parts of Africa but there's also a lot of trouble that comes into areas of poverty. So there's a lot of crime in there. Uh, I can remember Pastor Ron going into those areas where he would have a name of somebody to follow up and he'd, he'd be wandering through trying to find the, uh, the person that he was trying to uh, bring to the Lord. Uh, difficult areas. There's um, at least 30% unemployment um, 
which is a lot of people wandering around. But that's not just the Africans who are coming down um, uh, from the north, but these days uh, it's also uh, white people who are there. And it's not unusual to see on a street corner at the lights a white person with a signboard uh, explaining that they haven't got a job and, uh, and asking for help. Um, and others uh, who are there, coloured people, uh, black African people, um, who also might be on a street corner in that sort of a situation. At the moment, the, um, uh, the power in Cape Town uh, is uh, the, the electricity is in dire straits. For some years now, they've been doing what they call load shedding, and that means that they will stop the electricity for a period of time during the day. And uh, that period of time now has increased so that four times a day for two and a half hours, your power is off wherever you are in the town. And um, so that makes it difficult. That's, they, they've got it at stage six. They believe it's going to stage 10 soon. Um, so you don't know if your fridge is going to survive that. So you don't know what you're going to do with your food, your freezer. Uh, you, you, you probably buy more on a daily basis than you do on a weekly basis. And, uh, and your lights, of course, are going to go out. You're not going to have hot water. Um, uh, what do you do for cooking, etc., etc. You've got to time it all. So when we went visiting some of the saints there, um, it was no surprise that all of a sudden the power would go out and they've got these little lights that they plug in that are charged, they're an LED light, and as soon as the lights go out, these lights come on automatically and uh, they're just sort of set to the darkness. And so you sit in there with this sort of ambient light, having fellowship with them. And, um, and what, maybe just to paint a bit of a picture, they, they're not complaining. This is their life. Um, it's what they're used to. Um, they, many of them live behind bars and gates. You know, it's, it's shut up. You know, their homes hard up against each other. Um, and, um, but you, you come into their home and is a, as warm a fellowship as you would get anywhere. There's not... Uh, a feeling of lack um, of how things might be going and and you just sort of think about this here in the light of the scriptures maybe let's just look at 2 Corinthians 8 I better watch my time um, I haven't been here for a few weeks and I feel like uh, I've got a bit of time to make up for so was it two hours I had Pastor Chris? <laughs> um 2 Corinthians ch chapter 8 and um, there was a, a great financial need here in the church because there had been uh, uh, it talks about a dearth in the land and whether this was a drought or, or what it was but there was great need and in verse 1 moreover brethren we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia how that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their libera liberality. For to their uh, power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. And so it's just writing here of a church that didn't have a lot, but they gave a lot. And, and where they had learnt this is we read down in verse um, 9, the whole passage is talking about it but he says in verse 9 for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich yet for your sakes he became poor that ye through his poverty might be rich and this is the lesson of Christ's love that though he was with his father in riches and perfection and greatness and glory that for our sake he came down and made himself poor and allowed himself to be abused that we might become rich, but not in wealth, but in faith, in love, in hope. Those qualities of the divine nature that he wanted to be in us. Now, we might not always feel like that, you know, in the day-to-day -day slug, when you're, someone's giving you trouble at work or your school project's a bit hard and keeping you up till all hours. But the Lord wants to remind us of it and say, I've got you, I've got you. You're, you're in a safe place. You're going to live forever. 
I'm, I'm, I'm looking after you. There's, there's nothing for you to worry about. And, uh, and maybe just bearing in mind even this time of convention when we've got people coming, you know, from all over and we're looking after them here. And we see that same nature come out in the saints to say, I can help. I mightn't have heaps, but I'll use what I've got to help because uh, I know how much benefit there is in this. I know how much the Lord has done for me. And, and, and when we see that, those good qualities come out of ourselves, we, we rejoice because of the, the goodness that it brings uh, to all of us one way or another. Um, better look at something to finish on. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. One of the little things I enjoyed, and Kathy noticed too, one of the homes we were in in South Africa and, um, and under this sort of dim light, the, the lady of the house was bringing around some, uh, a cup of tea and, and uh, some things that um, they had made for us to eat. And her young daughter was coming behind her holding um, some small plates, you know, just enjoying watching what her mother was doing and wanting to do the same thing and um, it's just nice to see uh, those sort of things being taught which are, are valuable qualities. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 51 Behold I show you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. And we're preparing for this day. We're preparing for it now in how we lay up treasure and what we choose to do with our time, with our conversations, with our hopes, and uh, how we handle our circumstances. And the Lord has given us everything to be able to deal with what is around us. We might not always feel that, but he's reminding us that, yes, it is there, and, and, and all of a sudden something will come through and you might feel like you're in the middle of a fire of, of some sort of test but we know the stories that we have in the word that there was a fourth man in the fire and, and that we will, we will stand that we will not be let down because the love of God is now in us and with us and around us to help us to endure and to overcome and, and so may we be ready for that day where we've sort of prepared ourselves. You know, we're just cleaning up my father-in-law's home. He passed away, not in the Lord. And boy, there's a lot of stuff in that house. And you know, all that stuff that had a lot of effort in it and a lot of time given to it, a lot of it just, you pick out a few things that you might want to remember and where does the rest go, sadly? To the dump. All those things that we build up, what are they worth at the end? May we really lay up treasure in heaven and be thankful for what God has given us and use it to our heart's content. All the people said, Amen. Pastor Chris.